This is super exciting and scary, and this has been such a fun conference so far. I want to thank John and the other organizers for bringing me. This is um, really a really cool opportunity, and I'm, I'm really feeling grateful for it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this conference is about data and community, and I was asked here to come speak because of the work I've been doing since late November, helping people come together to build a community around saving data. And as you've heard, I was one of the people who built, um, who worked to build Data Refuge and who collaborated in supporting the many data rescue events that have happened around the country. That work has been profoundly and overwhelmingly powerful for me personally, and it has helped me think differently about data and communities. Don't worry, I'll get less nervous and more cheerful as we go forward. <laughs> um, I've learned this about myself. Um, that said, I still find this whole project really difficult to talk about. I don't feel like I fully processed what all of this means or what I think should happen differently. Um, I'm definitely not gonna offer an answer to how, should, how we should save federal climate and environmental data. I don't know yet. I will say what I do know is that it is very hard and <laughs> that those people who are offering answers that seem pretty easy are probably not um, looking at the whole picture. And, uh, and so this is work that we will have to undertake with many, many communities over time. So um, rather than talk about data and communities, what I'm going to spend some time talking about is contexts and institutions. The more I have thought and learned about data and communities, the more I want to talk about context with, together with data and the notion of communities within and across institutions. I'm going to talk about what Data Refuge has taught me about data, Wait, that's metadata, stories, meaning, and context, and about community, the beautiful, powerful potential of our civic and educational institutions, and the frustrating and powerful conservatism of our bureaucracies. This is not all going to flow perfectly and wrap up nicely. The world is messy, and we all love a clean CSV, myself very much included. <laughs> but the world outside of the CSV is deeply complicated, and that's the world that I work in. So first, a little about me. Um, if you followed the news, um, you'll see that I am a rogue scientist. Race <laughs> racing to save da climate data from Trump. This, um, this was one of our favorite, um, uh, we had, we've now counted, there's like 112 articles written in the press that we've been able to find or more about um, this project. And this was our favorite. It was right after our data rescue event at Penn. And um, we really wanted to change it to middle management, institutional librarians, and humanists <laughs> work to ensure long-term preservation of citable and contextual data and metadata from federal sources. Um, you can see why I'm a librarian and not a headline writer. But I do think it's important to point out that I got into this work because I am a librarian and my institution and my colleagues believe in and support this work because they believe that we should be doing this, that this is part of what we signed up for when we chose this as our career. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about what my actual job is and then I'll go further into the work of Data Refuge um, and Data Rescue and talk, um, and I will talk like about distributed networks and data packets and that sort of thing. But first, like, what do I do in my day job? So uh, I head up the digital scholarship department in my library where our group focuses on collaborating with faculty and students on creating new kinds of scholarship. Uh, Margaret Jantz, who's a key collaborator on Data Refuge, works on data management and curation in her day job. We have two colleagues who work on open access publishing um, and two people who are really talented. They're all really talented. I am very lucky. Um, who, but these two people who are talented developers and also have advanced degrees, one PhD and a master's in humanities subjects, who work on text mining, corpus building, designing new kinds of scholarly interfaces, data sets, et cetera. And by the way, I'm currently hiring a mapping and geospatial specialist if you know anybody. We don't claim to be the only place on campus or in the world where people can do all these things. We are not the single source of help. The library has never been the single source of information. But instead, we're there because there's a need and because people want, to, people want the kind of help that we're providing. And importantly, because our institution thinks it's worth hiring people whose job it is to increase the capacity for this kind of work. There was a version of this talk um, where I just talked about what everyone, people's 
jobs were in various institutions that were um, where this data refuge work happens to kind of call attention to the, while I've been working so hard on building this volunteer community, um, just trying to call attention to like what, what are the jobs of people? But I'm not gonna do that because it turns out that would be a very boring talk. Um, but I do think it's important as we think about the work that needs to be done to think about whose job it is. I've been a librarian for more than 15 years and um, while people generally seem to like librarians and the general public certainly trusts us on some things, there's often um, a kind of sadness that I sometimes hear from people in the software community for me. Like, oh my gosh, it must be so hard for you. You're about to lose your job because <laughs> the internet solved learning. Um, <laughs> like, um, and, uh, so I'll just say um, that has not been my experience. Um, <laughs> And while communities are in some cases defunding libraries, there are still, um, and there are about 120,000 libraries in the United States. They are busy. People use them and value them. Sometimes they are not as well supported um, in the same way that we are failing to support so many of our civic institutions, but it isn't for lack of use. Um, so just enough, um, I'm, at, I'm at a pulpit. This is a bad time to be lecturing. Okay. So the Data Refuge project actually got its start um, on the lower Schuylkill River. Um, this is a map of Philadelphia. The big river that you see most obviously is the Delaware River. Um, and then the, the river in the middle, I wish I had a pointer. Oh well, I'm pointing, I'm gonna use my arm. Um, <laughs> so uh, where it says Philadelphia, right, this, that narrow part is the center city and right above it where the green begins along the Schuylkill River, that's the art museum. You've probably seen pictures of the Schuylkill River at the art museum. You may, in your mind, if you can conjure them up, picture a falls. There's like a small falls lower than that, right? Be below that. So all the way through center city and all the way through the rest of the city is the tidal Schuylkill. It is understudied. There is insufficient data. You can see a lot of the banks of the Schuylkill River as you get further, closer to the airport, closer to where the Schuylkill meets the Delaware. It's as if this map, there's, oh, there's nothing there. The city of Philadelphia just decided not to do anything there. That's not true. That is the home to the largest um, oil refinery on the eastern seaboard. The largest oil refinery on the eastern seaboard is inside the city of Philadelphia. Um, <laughs> and it takes up both sides of the river. Um, the river is actually public land. It is our public asset, like our public data, and yet there is very little access to the river. That little patch of green over on the west side where it says whatever number that is, that's Bartram's Garden, and we've partnered with Bartram's Garden in trying to create an interface to um, a database or a platform, um, a data set, that would allow us to expose what we, sh what we do know or should know or can know about the neighborhood and the river, including scientific data, including um, historical information, and including the stories of the people who live there. So this is uh, this neighborhood that's sort of, I can't use that arm, this neighborhood, um, there's a neighborhood called Eastwick that's really close to there. It's not important that you know exactly where it is. <laughs> um, so this is from the Eastwick Friends and Neighbors um, Association, this is from recently, like I guess a couple months ago, and that you probably can't read this, but I will just say that the environmental um, justice and health issues in this um, relatively poor community in Philadelphia are pretty um, outstanding. And so the program in environmental humanities led by the director of that program, Bethany Wigan, who is um, a collaborator and now really good friend of mine, um, had been working on a public and participatory project. She co-directs the River Research Seminar with Pete DiCarlo, who's an atmospheric scientist and produces a ton of data. He used to work for, on federal data um, professionally for the federal government, and now he's a professor at Drexel, and, um, and Danielle Redden, who runs the public boating program. And so the three of them have a, a seminar to look together about what can we learn about this lower Schuylkill River. So that's how I met them. They came to me, they asked for basically software development, a database, a platform, to share all these kinds of data. And what they really wanted was to be able to make tours so that you could physically walk through the landscape and see views of it that include science, that allow you to create new data. Um, and we're gonna do that, we got distracted. But, um, but that's still happening. <laughs> so, um, at the, right after the election, the graduate students in the program for environmental humanities got concerned about the potential loss of access to federal climate and environmental data. They came to the library. Um, they asked 
they, they decided to have an event January 13th and 14th. Um, they asked us to help and Data Refuge was born. Uh, it is a program of the, the PPEH lab is the program for environmental humanities. Penn is the first one, Penn program for environmental humanities. And, um, and it's a collaboration with the library to build Data Refuge. Um, we were not the only ones who were having these thoughts or concerns or who were making plans and there have been many, many efforts that have um, started and contributed to and helped support data rescue. I'll mention in particular um, the event that happened in Toronto in December and that um, was one of the sparks for this group Edgy to form and they have collaborated with us in helping out with some events. I mean, they, they, they and us, we have collaborated together in supporting events. But before that all happened, when we were just trying to understand, we decided, we landed on this goal, right? We wanted research co quality copies of federal, environmental, and climate data. So first question, is the risk real? The answer is yes, absolutely, for a whole host of reasons, some of which I'll talk about. But the answer pretty quickly became clear when we started calling around like every expert we could think of and every community we could think of, yes, the risk is real. So what does research quality mean and how does that enter in? And this is something we just heard from scientists over and over again as we had conversations with them. It wasn't enough for someone to say, hey, don't worry, the EPA took that data down, here is a copy. They needed to be able to cite that copy. They needed it to be research quality. They needed to be able to claim that they could prove that this was the real data. And that turns out to be really difficult um, to create research quality copies, um, citable copies that use the kinds of trust that academics have built up over, honestly, centuries of kind of institutional agreements to replicate that in some technical way is not trivial. Um, we'll keep talking about that as we go on. Same with copies. Um, again, it turns out there's a, the goals begin to change. Um, when, you, when this is what you want to do, you, you end up needing to change the way that you approach um, copying. Um, and then when we think about federal environmental and climate data, to be clear, we think really capaciously human beings are part of the environment. And so data about people is also environmental data. Um, and then we get to this issue of data. So as for data, so uh, I'll just point out what you all know, but that has been really driven home to me through this project, that in the minds of many, many people, members of a very broad public, data isn't a terribly clear term. Right? Everything on your screen, technically, is equally data. In fact, everything on your screen is equally data and it's all structured, or else it wouldn't be able to show up on your screen. And so this notion of kind of what we mean by data changes dramatically as we move across communities and it becomes hard to think and talk in a public way about saving data when we, without acknowledging that what people have in their mind when you're talking about data really varies from person to person. So that's the scope of the problem, and it was huge. It still is. Um, it's also worth calling attention to the fact that many people have been working on parts of this problem for decades and have made tremendous progress. People have been working for weeks, months, and years, and we can build to, on the work that's been done. Um, but this is still before, I'm still in our story, before the data rescue event in Philly, trying to figure out what are we, like we were, aiming for before the inauguration, right? Our event was January 13th and 14th. So what's the, how do we, how do we slice and dice the world of federal information? So that's, I mean, God, I, we had frustrating meetings, like where's the list? Like, <laughs> there's no list, there's no list. Uh, so you can organize it by data format or size, right? So there are folks who are ready to and actually good at and have some pipelines for copying petabytes of data. So that's a size, right? So maybe they should just copy the petabytes wherever they are because they have a way to copy petabytes of data. And like most, we're not gonna do that at an event, um, right? And then there's things like videos. Like maybe you just want a pipeline for all the videos everywhere. Or there's a group working on PDFs, right? There's format and size. There's also the agency. This is a very obvious one and what some people kind of thought of as the default, right? There's like, did you get all the data from the EPA? Did you get all the data? And then inside the EPA, what are the programs that produce data? That's another way of slicing and dicing it. Um, there's also this covered by federal records laws. So there are a whole bunch of laws about what you can and can't do with kinds of records that are produced by the federal government. And so it might make sense to make lists based on the, the laws that apply to what you can and can't do. 
Um, and what we, what we wanted to do, right, the goal, because we, this was like a, an emergency measure, was to get the most valuable and vulnerable first, to find this perfect intersection of the data that is most valuable and vulnerable and then get that really quick before it, it goes away was the thinking. And so how do you measure value and vulnerability? Um, we, I, I can say like there isn't a perfect way, but one of the things that, the kind of framework that we, we landed on after, after conversations with many, um, with a lot of people who have different kind of views of the government information ecosystem were that there were basically these four kinds of vulnerabilities. Um, and this is, you know, this is not a perfect system at this point. But legal vulnerabilities, right, what laws are in place to require the collection, safety, and redistribution of these data? What enforcement mechanisms back up these laws? There's a lot of laws that have no enforcement mechanisms, no funding to help make that possible, and no checking to see if it has happened. So that's another uh, kind of legal vulnerability. There's technical vulnerability, which like I'm not going to talk about very much in this context because you can all probably call out 10,000 things about technical vulnerability that, it, yes, so there's, that's a thing, <laughs> right? Political vulnerability. Um, do we have good reason to expect that this data set is particularly ta targeted by hostile political forces? Um, do we have good reason to expect that the agency and or unit who produce and maintain the data are particularly targeted by hostile political forces or that their funding is unstable? And the answer to that is yes, we do. There's a lot of things like that. Um, and then are the primary users associated with this data set the targets of hostile political form, um, forces? So these are all questions, things, issues that might make data more vulnerable. And then the uses and uniqueness of data is like a catch-all for a bunch of other things that make data vulnerable. Um, but things like it's just super unique or the census that has a ton of rules and laws around it, but it's still kind of like, holy shit, but it's the census. Um, so we did a survey. The Union of Concerned Scientists has been a really fantastic partner and they sent this survey out in late December and then we realized no one answers surveys in like, on like December 28th, even though, <laughs> even though we, we were like working like crazy. Um, that wasn't a great time to send a survey, so we sent it out again and got a bunch of responses. So it's a CSV conference, there's the responses. Um, <laughs> and that did help a lot. It helped us to pick out the things to start with. Um, so, and then we, um, the weekend before the event in Philly, we spun up a CCAN instance um, and set up some S3 buckets to store some data. Um, you know, this is understanding that we will need to think about this for the more long term, but we're talking about right now, what can we do? Um, and then we had an event. Um, and it turns out that the way that we, it played out at the event is that the way that we sliced and diced the data was really more like by how it can be saved. So it was a combination of things, right? It was like going by agency and the folks at Edgy came up with this, this system for sort of systematically going web page by web page. Um, through a particular program or agency and then, um, but basically the idea was if the way, if the Internet Archive can get it, that's citable. You can cite the Internet Archive. So good. No one wants to get their data from the Wayback Machine. I don't think. I haven't met anyone who's like, that's good. My data's... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, solve problems one at a time, right? Um, so the idea was if it can go to the Wayback Machine, great. There are a bunch of things like query interfaces and research data sets that the Wayback Machine doesn't really get, that the web crawlers don't get. And so we focused on those um, as a separate kind of workflow. And so the event paths that we had at our event and that went to lots of data rescue events in other places had people seeding and sorting the, web, the Wayback Machine and figuring out what things are uncrawlable and how we might harvest them. And then a bunch of people um, scraping sites and trying to get inside query interfaces to get the data out, um, checking and bagging and describing so that we could have a little bit of control, a little bit of security, a little bit of chain of custody, only, all, only a tiny bit of each, but to help add some security, um, some sort of trust for scientists and researchers in the data. And then we also had the storytelling path, um, right? This is um, a humanists. Uh, and people who, with whom we've sort of built a community. And so the notion that one of the ways of saving data is making sure people understand how important it is. So that the outreach is actually part of the saving process. Um, the understanding, building an understanding of 
For instance, um, the Office of Sustainability in the city of Philadelphia re relies on federal climate data to make um, recommendations of how, about various like road building plans. And so to create stories, to really write out beautiful, clear stories about here's a federal data set, here is how it is used by a federal agency, uh, by, a, by a city agency, and here is a member of the community who's, um, whose life is affected by that use. So that was the storytelling route. And then, of course, understanding that we were acting in this kind of bucket brigade, we wanted to make sure that there was space at the event for people to talk about the long trail. What, what should we do in the future? How can we make this more sustainable? Um, so from there, it went, you know, we had some spreadsheets, there became a workflow, the workflow became a web app. Brendan, thanks. Um, this, this all became a system, which was kind of codified, right? And that's awesome, and it also means that um, a lot of people are like, great, now we've, we know how to do this. Like, we don't know how to do this, right? <laughs> this isn't the way, it's a way that worked for, for a while, and I think um, we continue to learn. But, um, but, that's, and, but it did, this did, in a really exciting and awesome way, allow for like 50 data rescue events to happen around the country, for many thousands of people to find a place for themselves in this work, to begin to understand what it means. And I think that um, has been, that's been really like inspiring and amazing. Um, and I'm, I'm here kind of, so let's like do a little bit of dirty laundry, right? Um, this is from Data Refuge, and uh, from the data set says, this is a catalog of data descriptions. It does not seem to contain any actual data, and although many of the data sources listed have a tab that says data set, nothing loads. So this, like, <laughs> Someone identified that this was uncrawlable. This is a community-based effort, right? This is volunteers. So like this is, there is data in there that is mad valuable that I feel super proud of, but there's also, I don't know, I'm not putting blame on something, but this is like a, draws into question a little bit. Like did we definitely need to go through this entire complicated process for this zip file? Um, but to be clear, this zip file, unlike many, many of the data sources out there, is in data.gov. But even in data.gov, it's like not quite clear what this is for. It says, um, the RCS is a super catalog of components, services, solutions, and technologies that facilitate search, discovery, and collaboration in order to promote quality and savings in software development through sharing and reuse. Um, <laughs> thank you, EPA. Um, <laughs> so I. I mean to say only that the, the problem here um, is not just that like we did something wrong or that like volunteers can't do stuff. It's really that the, um, this system that, we just, that we're working on isn't quite the way that we would want to do this, right? We were trying to make an attempt to say, okay, there's query interfaces, right? And we're gonna pull the data out, and we're gonna add whatever contextual web pages we need, and we're gonna add a little bit of metadata, and then we're gonna create this research data set, and that will be worth saving. And I. You know, I'm, I, I clearly thought that was the right thing to do. I'm not saying it isn't, but I think what we, we all know we need to do is move upstream, right? We need to move upstream in the data production process so that the data that's produced um, works a little bit better. So we, what we really want is for producers to be understanding themselves as making something more like a data package um, where, hey, thanks, Max. Um, <laughs> Um, so I want to just give a, a, like a shout out as we've learned about this to um, the DAT project and this notion of frictionless data, thinking about um, how are we going to, and especially, um, especially in terms of the DAT project, but in terms of also just my collaborations with John and Max and folks at data.gov, I think the way that they're approaching sort of welcoming people who work in federal agencies, whose job it is to produce this data, the way that the folks at data.gov are kind of working slowly with them and understanding that they all have jobs and that we're gonna, we, there's room for us, for a set of volunteers, for a community to help them make some better metadata. Um, and I think that's an avenue that has some real potential, um, especially as a librarian. Um, but I do also wanna talk a little bit about this kind of multiple meanings of metadata. Oh, I never ever thought, thought I would say that. <laughs> it's terrible. No one's like, I want you to talk about the multiple meanings of metadata. I, but um, someone recently used the term paradata to me to describe like the, the kind of universe of things one would need to know about data in order to use it. It's like more than metadata. Um, and 
I have had a conversation recently about software preservation and all of these, the notion that like the data doesn't, it doesn't, um, we all want data that exists sort of, that has all of its meaning right there in itself, but that's not actually how humans communicate meaning, right? Like <laughs> that, that the notion of passing a data set to another person, which I am, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to make good quality data and trying to use and reuse good quality data, um, but when you, when you give someone a data set, there's a whole bunch of assumptions about what they know and can do and how they can make use of it and what they already understand about um, what is coming to them, like that they know how to read these, um, not just, not as much as you would need, not, sorry, not questions that can be answered by a data dictionary or a code book. And so um, I will think about, uh, I will use a quote from my friend Rachel Pell who keeps insisting that she's quoting other people, which I'm sure she is, which, and maybe you've heard this, but I love it. Um, metadata is a love letter to the future. So um, imagining that the metadata, the data that you create around your data is not just for another machine that can use your data, and it's not even just for another person who probably has exactly the same set of assumptions that you have, but might also be for some future person or people or computer um, or person using computer that is, um, has a different set of expectations and what's the kind of set of stuff that you need. Um, this is all really complicated and it, um, it, it requires a lot and I want to be clear, it's not worth doing for all of our data. It's actually worth doing for only a very small part, the part that we want to see last, right, for a long time, which that's why there's like whole communities around doing that. Um, but I think this notion, like when I've just done, it's kind of blow up, I, we need everything, we need the software, we need the stories in order to make the data useful, like that just makes swimming upstream even harder, um, right? And so this is my terrifying, um, swimming upstream is dangerous. <laughs> um, but I also think a big reason, so I think that this notion that there's only some stuff that we can do that for, but still we want data producers to think a little bit differently, to move a little bit in the direction of creating data that is reusable, right? Um, and these, this bear in this picture, picture is really our institutions, right? They, they kind of do slow things down in some cases. Um, no offense to institutions. Um, but so federal uh, I work in an institution, libraries, um, that have a whole ton of baggage and I work in, and libraries, the libraries that I've worked in in my career are part of uh, academic institutions that have a whole lot of baggage. Um, so I work in an institution inside of an institution. They slow things down, they discourage brilliant people from doing new things, they value the wrong stuff, they reinforce racist, sexist, heteronormative, and ableist hierarchies. Um, and they are also communities of people, people with jobs who are paid to do things that we probably in this room mostly really value. Um, and I think I, I wanna um, refer to, I saw a talk by an archivist at Princeton named Jarrett Drake, who's really awesome, you should read everything he's ever written, um, where he basically went through uh, higher ed institutions and like read their mission statements just read them out loud and then talked about the, the ways that over their histories they have failed um, their communities that, and sort of the power in holding our institutions accountable to the values that they espouse. And um, I have a lot of faith in that. And I have a lot of faith in that because it's truly been my work, right? This is what I've, for 15 years, I've been a librarian, I've worked in an institutional context, and I care a lot about seeing my library do things that are like technically smart and also that are ethically good. And the ways that that has worked in my life is by holding my library and my institution accountable to the values that they espouse, encouraging them and asking them and sort of making the trust that we have in our institutions an active trust. And so um, in the spirit of, uh, of like hearkening back to missions and what is our values, and um, this is the part where I just thank Sherry Laster who had a brief where I was like, I don't wanna talk about open data starting in 2008, I wanna go back further. And so she gave me a history lesson. Um, she's in the audience, she's a government documents librarian, she's really smart. Um, so uh, I don't know if she's actually here. There she is, thanks Sherry. Um, so 
This is a quote from James Madison, with whom I don't agree about a lot, but I love this. A popular government without popular information or a means of acquiring it is but prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. I think we all can relate to that right this minute, right? Um, <laughs> um, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. And so I think by kind of framing the open data movement within this much longer um, insistence that a civic society needs to, um, must uh, enforce its institutions to li live to a set of shared values and share what they know, um, it goes back further. Um, and this is, again, tied to our institutions of cultural memory. Um, that we have long believed this is important and we have long, as a society, funded um, institutions so that people have jobs whose job is not to create a product or to get or to create profit for anyone but instead is to help society get better at learning and knowing things because that's actually a shared responsibility that's actually something that like I know this it's I yeah I'm just preaching whatever I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna stop it keeps going <laughs> um, okay so um, a little just briefer a little brief continuation on the history lesson quickly um, so there's an organization with, with, within the federal government whose current mission is to provide free, ready, and permanent public access to federal government information now and for future generations. Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, there is such an organization, and I think um, my hope is that we can find ways to reinvigorate that spirit in our government. I know our government right now is like a little bit tricky, but I actually don't want, I mean, I'm comfortable giving up on our parts of our government right now. <laughs> but the fact is there are like hundreds of thousands of people. Our government employs more people than our six top corporations. So there are a lot of people who, who we can continue to believe in um, and who we can continue to support. Um, in, and so this mission to provide free, ready, and permanent public access to federal government information now and for future generations. Um, to provide government information when and where it is needed in order to create an informed citizenry and improved quality of life. This mission is achieved through, so the program, for those of you who haven't caught on, is actually the Federal Depository Library Program, which was started in 1895 um, to send copies of federal documents that were produced, federal information, to libraries all over the country so that people could have access to them and also so that they, the federal, when the federal government's priorities change, which they always do, the federal government doesn't want, why, why would they keep providing access? And this is the example that I keep using is, um, when the Obama administration took office, they likely took down information about abstinence-only education. I am glad that they did that. That was weird, some weird thinking. <laughs> that said, it's sort of part of the process of changing governments. It doesn't mean that we as a culture should lose access to the fact that that was out there. The internet is a very presentist technology system. We, we, we don't pay a lot of attention. Like it doesn't do, it doesn't, it's not, beyond it doesn't do a very good job. It does an extraordinarily bad job of helping us to say, here is a little piece of the present that I wanna wrap up and give to the future because it's gonna become past soon, right? Like that's, the work that print publications did all the time, and we just don't have a very good way of doing that, and it, there is a loss in that, and it's something I think we need to figure out. I don't know that libraries are the answer. I think they're certainly not the only answer. There's no way for that. It needs to be a community effort, but it needs to be a community effort that actually believes that this is a thing that we need to value and pay people to do. Okay, and this is just, I can't resist. This is Adelaide Haas who I just learned about but is now my total hero. She was the first super, no, the second superintendent of documents, but she like created in, in the federal government, she created the way of organizing it. I'm just gonna read a few quotes about her. She came in, um, this is the, in when the, this, um, the FDLP was created. Uh, Thousands of documents dating back many years had accumulated helter-skelter in various areas of the office. <laughs> right, this is right now. <laughs> Additional publications clogged the storerooms of the House and Senate. None of these miscellaneous collections were arranged in a systematic way. From the chaos, Crandall, that's her, the guy who hired her, was expected to organize a sales stock, a depository library stock, and answer the many reference questions directed to his office by the general public. Crandall realized the difficulties he would face. In his first annual report, he noted that 
This is my favorite. This seems a simple and easy solution of the document problem. That is, however, not quite so simple as it seems. <laughs> Wait, sorry, I read that wrong. That it is, however, not quite so simple as it seems may perhaps be inferred from the fact that it has not sooner been adopted. <laughs> right? Like, um, at an, at a, as a matter of fact, it involves an enormous amount of labor and it needs to be skilled labor. Boom. Um, with these problems in mind, Crandall turned to Adelaide Hassa, um, and then she turns out to have been really awesome and badass, and no one liked her, and she got in a lot of trouble. She went out too late at night. Um, but, uh, but by 1897, the documents library had grown from nothing to a well-organized, selected, selected, important, collection of 16,481 print documents and 2597 maps. Um, in its completeness, so th that's the dream, right? except would multiply by like millions and millions. So um, that is to say, um, so that's my, my little side trip to the past, um, is to say that I think that one of the ways that we can think about data among the many is that they are, this is approximately equal to a sign that I now use all the time. Um, I think you've seen it like four times in this presentation. Um, that data and stories are actually deeply connected, that they are both ways that people have of sharing something that they believe is special, of picking out um, and transforming some part of the world and handing it to someone else and saying, I think there's some meaning in this. And so we can learn some from the way that we have shared stories in sharing data. Um, and with that, I, I'll just mention some of the um, directions that we see Data Refuge going in the future. Um, there's, so we, we are really psyched about events. I think they've been empowering and amazing. And if any of you feel like it, please, please get together with your community and organize an event. Um, but I will also say that um, what we're kind of, at least within the Data Refuge crew, thinking about is that what we'd like to see is events that are focused on this, this notion of designated communities. So identify a community that is meaningful to you um, and bring communities together to say, hey, what's the stuff that we care about? Let's save that stuff. You can, sure, you should check and see if it's already been saved, but if you and your community can't find it, go ahead and save it, right? Like, it, um, it's okay, and then to, to save multiple if your community needs it. So that's the kind of event that we're probably gonna try to um, encourage. We also have a project called Three Stories in Our Town that Bethany Wigan got funding from the National Geographic Society for, which is taking this um, kind of structured story that says the Office of Sustainability um, for a city, the, a federal data set, and a person, and making a connection across those um, and doing that for a bunch of towns. So that's a project that we're gonna continue to work on that's really exciting. And then, ooh, sorry, the Mozilla Foundation and the Associ Association of Research Libraries and the Penn Libraries are co-sponsoring a meeting next week to talk about this new, what we hope will be this, um, 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 a new way of understanding the kinds of stuff that we might want to save and how we can approach it called the Libraries Plus Network. The plus is because we need to build communities within our institutions and also across institutions. We have so much that we need to learn from the tech community and we have so much that we can offer. And there isn't just like one tech community and one library community. You all know, right? You're in the tech community and yet you're this, this is, you are all from a bunch of different communities. Um, and so the notion that we have to build community across our institutions, we have to build networks, um, and we have to empower people within institutions. Empower not just by kind of yelling at them, but by supporting them and encouraging them and helping them build the kind of institutions that we want um, to see. So here are the folks that we're bringing together. Um, this is the institutions represented. Um, there are, I think, 60 people. Unfortunately, the meeting is totally full. Um, we didn't know it was gonna be so popular. Um, it's at New America Foundation. And I hope that what will come out of that is, um, is a path forward that will be distributed. Um, I don't believe that we can hoard everything. I don't mean to suggest by this talk about institutions that I believe that we need to have like static repositories that have stuff on a server. Like I think we need to think really expansively about what the technologies that we use as we think about this distributed system. But I also think that I don't want to lose sight of the power of the sort of trust that we have in our institutions. Um, and then for me, um, I would love to, I think, 
Um, we would love, so I hope the Libraries Network takes off. I'm super excited about it. I also think that that work is gonna happen across a huge number of people. Um, one of the things that we're gonna do in my group is go back to our local community and think about building a platform that is not um, centralized, that's decentralized um, and open, uh, but that helps uh, researchers at Penn who create data and also members of our community who need data um, to make sure that we have safe, citable, reliable access to and long-term preservation of the data that we need for the future. So going back to the Eastwick friends and neighbors and trying to build the platform that they want. Thank you. Thank you.